keeping the, the town up and running. If mining shuts down, what happens to property prices? Does anyone want to take a guess? They go down, exactly. What happened on, for example, the Gold Coast a few years ago when tourism dropped off and everybody bought those high-rise apartments? What happened to those apartments in terms of the price? Exactly, they went down. Um, what's another key fundamental? Government infrastructure. If the government is spending hundreds of millions of dollars in a particular area, well, they've done their research, they're paying you with tax-funded money, um, you can be sure that if government infrastructure is being put into an area, if you invest in that area prior to that infrastructure coming in, it's a pretty good indicator that that particular area will be self-sufficient and you could be in for some capital gains. Can we get another click? Strategic importance. Well, what do we mean by strategic importance? That could mean any number of things. Um, I'll use an example, say, for example, Townsville, the strategic importance of Townsville. Well, what do we know about Townsville? Well, it's pretty much the second largest city in Queensland at this point in time. It serves as a major trade route for the ever-expanding Asia-Pacific region. That's pretty important. Um, and from a military point of view, it's also very important. So st strategy is very important in terms of its particular area. So if you can find an area like a Sydney or a Townsville or, or a satellite city like Bendigo, at least you can be sure that there is further growth later on down the track. Foreign investment. Now, you've all probably been reading the newspapers and, and watching television and hearing about people coming in from China or Singapore. Um, what do you think increased demand from overseas countries means for property prices? That's right, they tend to go up. So foreign investment is a very, very strong key driver of property prices. I'm from Melbourne originally. In the suburb that I live in, we have a lot of really good private schools. And that is the number one reason why we're getting foreign investment. People from, say, Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan and China purchasing the real estate in the area because they want to be in the school zones. And that is increasing demand and pushing the prices up. So foreign investment is extremely important. It's happening everywhere. It's even happening in Brisbane because we're at the right time of the cycle. Scarcity of quality land. So what do we mean by scarcity of quality land? What we're looking at is when a developer comes in and is ideally looking for a potential parcel of land to develop, he needs to look at certain things. How much of the land is actually available on the market right now? Because if there's a glut of demand, if there's just a glut of supply, sorry, if there's just too much, he's not going to be able to lock his profits in. So we want to look at areas where there's not a whole lot of competition, but the land, when you go to sell it later on down the track, you know that there's not a whole lot of competition later on down the track. Any other dot points at all? Um, oh, yes. and, and the <laughs> ability to add value. What do we mean by adding value to real estate? Does anyone want to take a guess or, or put their hand up? Rezoning. Rezoning, yep. That could be adding value. Anyone else? Supermarkets. Supermarkets, added infrastructure, adding value to the area. Schools, yep. Anyone else? Yeah, change the use of the home into a business, adding the uh, rezoning, putting another level on the home, even a, a renovation. If you're adding value to property, you can be guaranteed you'll be making some profits later on down the track. Um, oh, and most, most importantly, a fast growing population. Is it safe to assume that Australia has a very fast growing population? Absolutely. Yeah, Over to you, mate. interesting statistic. I don't know if people saw it, it was in the paper yesterday, I think. You know, I think it was in 2003, there was a prediction that Australia's population would reach uh, 23 million by 2050. 23 million by 2050. Does anyone know what Australia's population is now? Yeah, it's 23 million in 2015. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit. But these fundamentals, by the way, this is what you should look for because this is what we look for. So the question is, is it likely for you to go out, go through, you know, maybe 100 different areas around Australia, look for the land, and then come up with a few million dollars to buy the land? Or is it better to work with someone like us who becomes the owner and developer of the land and leverage off our, our time. Jamie's spoken about leverage this weekend or today, yes? OK, this is great leverage for you and, you know, especially for our members because you can leverage off our time to get into the options we can make available to you. OK, about that population growth, just following up on that, 
Who is aware of sort of... Who knows what the population of Melbourne is at the moment? Just yell out some guesses. Three million? Four and a half? Four, does anyone know? Because most people actually do think Melbourne is, is three million. Melbourne is currently about 4.25 million people. OK, it's the second fastest growth city in Australia behind where? What's been growing massively in the last 10 years? No, not Brisbane. Perth. Perth. Why? Commodities boom. OK, that's probably going to level out a bit. But the interesting thing is that you can just see over there, and this, by the way, this is Australian Bureau of Statistics. By 2053, Melbourne's going to be bigger than Sydney. OK, a lot of people don't know that. Do you guys know that the trend reversed about five years ago of people moving from Queensland to Victoria? It used to be Victorians used to want to get out, OK, live on the Sunshine Coast or the Gold Coast. That's reversed for the last five years. And the reason I'm bringing that up now is that a lot of our projects you're going to find are in and around Victoria and, in particular, Melbourne, because what was one of the key fundamentals? Fast-growing population, OK? So that's very important. Let's have a quick look at some of the sophistication, I guess, of investors. And, Josh, if you want to run through some of the key points there. Yeah, absolutely. Look, over the last nine years, I've had the privilege of working with just your average mum and dad investors, sitting down at their kitchen table at 9 o'clock at night after the kids have gone to bed and just talking about the ins and outs of basic property investment. And on the other side of that, I've sat around 36-year-old guys who are dyslexic that are worth $80 million and come up with marketing strategies and feasibility reports just to help them get their large-scale projects off track. And what you start to notice over the course of a few years, speaking with different people on different ends of the spectrum, is there's probably a top eight to 10 characteristics of an average buyer, an average Joe down the street, versus an advanced investor, someone who can use proper strategies to get real results later on. So let's just go through these. Um, the average buyer, what does the average buyer do? Procrastinates and does nothing, or maybe just does something once every five or six years. You know, I'll do it later. Oh, look, I've got the money, but you know, I want to go on a holiday right now. Oh, look, it's a bit too expensive. I'll wait five years till properties cool down and I'll, I'll look for an opportunity then. As opposed to an advanced investor who is decisive and does what Jamie's been talking about quite a lot this evening, and that's taking action. Um, what else have we got? Emotional decisions. Um, so what do we mean by emotional decisions when it comes to investing in real estate? Well, sometimes I meet people who say have one investment property and I say, oh, oh look, where is it? And they'll say something like, oh, look, it's just around the corner near me mum's place. Oh, OK, fantastic. Why did you invest there? Dunno, just near me mum's. I can walk past it every now and then and, and, and have a look at it. OK, great. OK, that's one side. Whereas a sophisticated investor will make an informed commercial decision. So he will look at the demographics of the area, the population growth, all those key fundamentals that we spoke about earlier, and they'll make an informed commercial decision. And that can be the difference long term between having a property that maybe goes up $100,000 in five years or $600,000. Just those two simple things. Um, users gut feel. You know, somebody who just maybe grew up in a hometown once upon a time and, you know, wants to invest, doesn't really know where, but he'll use his gut feel and he'll just invest in a property back in the hometown where he used to live, as opposed to someone who uses tool and data. So what do we mean by tools? What tools can we use to invest in real estate? Well, maybe you can look at some past sales results, some growth history. Maybe you can buy a subscription to a property magazine or even a property membership at our company. Um, they could use RP data or jump on realestate.com and look at sold prices. You know, that's the difference between an average buyer who'll just go with his gut and just buy, you know, the first property he sees and someone who uses actual tools and data and leverages off that to make a proper decision. Um, another one that I find in my experience believes everything the agents say. Look, I hate to admit it, but you know, agents aren't your friend. They've got a job. They need to protect the vendor, and they're going to say whatever they need to say to get the highest possible price for the vendor. They're not there to help you buy a property. They're there to market the property on behalf of the vendor. So you can't really believe everything that they say. I'm sure they're good people, but they do have a job to do, and that's to extract as much money as possible from you. Um, as opposed to using objective data, 
once again, RP data, sold results, going through the newspaper even, these are the kind of things that even a, a normal person can use to help them make an informed commercial decision. Um, owns the property versus controls the property. Who's read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad or something like that? Yep, a few people. So you know Robert Kiyosaki. What's one of his most famous sayings? Own nothing, control everything. Exactly. I saw, I saw some of you mouthing that. Very, very good. Um, so we won't go into too much detail this evening, but you know, an average buyer will just buy a property under his or her own name as opposed to someone who might use say a trust, a discretionary trust or something like that and you know we can talk about that in our one-on-ones later on down the track. Um, tries to do everything versus having an A-team. So I'll, I'll use an example. Tries to do everything themselves. So they'll, like my girlfriend for example, she was living in a, a rental property and there was something wrong with the oven. So I said, oh we need to call the agent and you need to get that fixed and she said, oh well actually the landlord is taking care of the property. He lives two doors down and every time we need to do something, he'll just come down himself and, and he'll fix it. I know short term that sounds like a good idea, but the time and effort it takes to actually control two or three properties, you could be putting that to actually better use, whether it's your job, making more money in other, in other areas, or actually looking for other opportunities. As opposed to, say, having an A team, uh, so say for example I'm looking for a property myself and I'm looking for something to subdivide, well before I even go looking for properties I need to have an architect, I need a town planner, I need a construction cost consultant, I need someone on the ground to actually go look for properties for me. That's even before I buy something. So that's the difference between you know someone who's average who will just jump on realestate.com and, and float around put an offer in and then go to the bank, as opposed to someone who's got all their ducks lined up in a row to make sure that if they do see something, they can take action immediately. Um, and if you want to have a chat with either myself, Warren or James later on down the track about how to get a team together, our company has a lot of connections. If you need to speak to someone regarding finance or conveyancing, we can have that discussion later on as well. Um, what else have we got? Oh, cost focused versus value focused. So sometimes I speak to people about investing. I know they might have say three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars to spend on a property, and they'll say, "Oh, look, Josh, it's a good idea, but you know what? I've got to, I've got to buy it, and I've got to pay stamp duty, and then I've got to pay legal fees, and then I've got to pay bank fees." So they're focusing on the money coming out of their pocket, the initial costs, instead of focusing on the actual value that they're locking in long term. So they're looking at the small picture and they're using that fear to control them as opposed to actually focusing on the goal. What is the potential profit and how is this going to enrich my life later on down the track? Um, what else have we got? Cost focus, hopes for capital growth as opposed to knows how to make money up front. So hopes for capital growth, sometimes I call this the buy and pray strategy. This is what an average buyer will do. They'll buy a home maybe down the street from where they live and they'll sit on it and they'll just pray that it goes up in value because you know their mate down at the pub had a property and, and apparently it did quite well. As opposed to someone who knows how to make money up front. Well there are a ton of different strategies on how you can do this, how you can add value straight away. If you want to have a chat about that in more detail, um, have a chat with myself, Warren or James or book a consultation either today or tomorrow and we can go through a few different strategies on that. Um, ROA focus versus ROI focus. So when I talk about ROA I'm referring to the return on the asset as opposed to returning on the investment. So they'll look at the property as though it's like a family member. They'll have an emotional attachment to this particular property. They're looking at say the house itself or the land itself, something emotional, something that they've got a connection to as opposed to it's just an investment. It has one purpose and one purpose only and that is to fulfill whatever financial goals that they've got later on down the track. Um, you can't get the two confused guys because it could be the difference between having one or two investment properties and four, five, six later on. And the last one is being a retail buyer versus our members. Um, once again, I'll use myself as an example. We have people at the company that are working day in, day out who are looking for properties before they even hit the retail market. 
the reality is most of the properties that you see on realestate.com is just the stuff that people such as myself and other sophisticated investors reject. I was looking at a property yesterday morning in Geelong. The agent emailed me first and said, Josh, we've got this particular property. You can subdivide it. Do you want to put in an offer of 180? And I called my architect and I said, I need you to go out there. I need you to measure the block. I need you to see where the storage is, and I need you to see what the exact zoning is in relation to the area. I got an email back on Friday afternoon, and he said, Josh, look, it's a good property, but at the end of the day, it's in a particular gas zone. When you're gonna put a townhouse on the back, it's gonna cost you an extra 10 grand. From a feasibility point of view, I don't really think we should move on this. So I sent an email saying, look, thanks, but no thanks put it on realestate.com. Someone is going to pay $200,000 to $210,000 for that property at the end of the day. Um, I'm not prepared to spend an extra $30,000, $40,000 because I want to be able to know how to make my money up front. And to do that, you need to make money in real estate on the way in and on the way out, not just on the way out. That's what the average buyer does. Um, so I hope that was a little bit helpful. If anyone wants to have a chat about that in more detail, please let us know. We'll, we'll go from there later on today or tomorrow. Okay, so does everyone appreciate these are very, very crucial points? Okay, they may seem very basic and obvious, but like even the first one. Now, I know no one in this room has ever procrastinated, is that correct? You've never spent time making a decision, but I'm sure you've known someone that has. But these are very fundamental points to becoming not just a property investor, but an overall investor. Right, thanks for that, Josh. So what we might do is we'll just move through some of the questions. What is land banking? Just gives a very snapshot of that, and then we'll move into some more detailed questions. Yeah, look, land banking is simply the process of securing property today. Remember, rich dad, poor dad, we don't necessarily want to be buying assets right now. We just want to control them without having to pay for it until a later date. I guess one of the most important things to know about land banking is this is not necessarily a brand new strategy. Land banking has been around for a very, very long time. It originated in the UK a few hundred years ago. And land banking has been used in Australia for the last 70, 80 years. It's just that it's not really a mainstream strategy. Um, put your hand up if you've heard of Mervac, Stockland, Australand, Burbank. OK, these guys, these big boys, these large uh, multinational companies, they've been using land banking for a very, very long time. Um, it's just until recently, you know, a company such as ours has been able to take a very sophisticated strategy and to be able to break it down into a way that everyone can participate potentially. Terrific. Okay, next question. Where's my clicker, guys? There we go. Okay, the, why land banking as opposed to buying a, yep. a, a property and just putting a rental tenant in. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Jamie's going to touch on this in a little bit more detail tomorrow, but essentially it's the land component of property, generally speaking, that actually goes up a lot more than the dwelling itself. Um, who here has heard of the term depreciation benefits for tax minimization? Most of you, fantastic. Well, why is that? Because when you purchase a rental property, yeah, the land goes up in value, and when you sell, you pay your capital gains tax because you're making your money, but you're also claiming that depreciation benefit because the dwelling itself is actually going down in value. That's why you can claim those benefits in the first place. So it's the land that appreciates. Land is what we want to be investing in, and if we can find a way to do that without necessarily purchasing it straight away, then that's fantastic. Um, what's the second one? Control land without the ownership. Well, I just mentioned that. Um, no obligation to buy. Obviously, land banking is a property-based strategy, um, but let's just compare it to, say, I don't know, buying an apartment off the plan in Brisbane. Say you walk into a shiny display office and everything looks great. You speak to the agent who, remember, works for the vendor, not for you. Um, you buy an apartment off the plan, you pay a 10% deposit, and then you know, there's settlement in maybe a year and a half, two years when the building's complete, you are locked into that contract. You have given them your money, you are locked into a contract that says, if you cannot settle on the property, the developer reserves the right to not only take your deposit, but they can actually charge you penalty interest, and it happens all the time. Um, whereas with land banking, yeah, you can secure the land, you can do it legally, so you can potentially get 
all the capital gains over time. But if something were to happen later on down the track and you found yourself in a position where you maybe didn't want to buy the property anymore, well, at least there's no obligation to later on down the track. And we'll explain a little bit more in detail tomorrow. Property without loans. Yeah, once again, you go buy an apartment off the plan or just a house and land package or even you go on realestate.com and you see the house down the street, you want to buy it for your mum, say it's worth $500,000, well, you'll cough up a 5 or 10% deposit and then if you don't have the remaining 450, you've got to go to the bank and you've got to go to the bank manager and you've got to say, look, please, Mr. Bank, you know, this is what I own. This is what I've got now. This is how long I plan on working for. Please lend me $450,000. You know, I'll pay my 5% interest per annum, whatever it is at the moment. Um, and you're really at the mercy of the banks. Whereas with land banking, you're giving the opportunity to secure property today for an extended period of time without necessarily having to go to the bank. And speaking to a lot of people week in, week out, I find that a lot of my members already own one, two, three properties. Those properties might be worth, say, three to four hundred thousand dollars each. So they might have maybe nine hundred thousand dollars worth of property debt, which is a good position to be in. But if they were to go back to the bank and buy a fourth property, they wouldn't necessarily have the capacity to do so based on their wages or whatever their situation is. Enter land banking. Um, they've now given the opportunity to further invest in real estate without necessarily having to be at the mercy of the banks. Um, and if anybody wants to get a little bit more information, please let us know, or Jamie will cap off tomorrow as well on that topic. So just touching, just touching base, hello, just touching base very briefly there, does everyone understand the leverage now? The difference between, say, putting $20,000 deposit on a house that might be, or a block of land that might be 150 to 200,000, as opposed to putting 20,000 down, controlling that, but not having any actual obligation or any other costs for maybe 10 years. Everyone understand that? Yeah? Great, fantastic. Okay, so um, we might just t briefly touch on what is a land option, just to check that people are. Yeah. So, what is on. an who here is familiar with options in the stock market? A few of you, fantastic. So you know you've got your put options and you've got your call, excuse me, your call options. Well, an option over land gives you the right to reserve the property for a period of time. It could be five to seven years, seven to 10 years, seven to 12 years, without any holding costs associated with property ownership. So as you know, those who own property, you've got council rates you've got to pay, water rates, if it's a rental property, property management fees, insurances and things like that, or a loss in borrowing capacity. And all the while, you're holding the potential upside in the capital growth over time, and you're not even obligated to settle on the land. So I know we've repeated a few things a couple of times, but it just takes a few times to explain just to get the message through. And once again, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them through at the end. Okay, so. What are the main ways that you can actually purchase a land option? Yeah, look, we have different members from different walks of life, as Warren explained earlier, with different um, uh, investment price levels. So we try and accommodate as many people as we can. Um, we're not allowed to give any advice on super, of course, but superannuation is an actual avenue that people have been known to use to invest in land banking. Yeah, so we're, we're fortunate also just there. John Collignon, the CEO of Sequoia, will be doing a presentation tonight on superannuation. So you can hear from John and then catch up with him. Mm. What are the other two main ways that people invest in land banking? Well, when I do my appointments in the office, you know, if this is something that people tend to qualify for and if they're interested, I always ask the question, you know, how do you invest, you know, plan on investing? Would it be, say, cash or maybe some borrowed funds? Perhaps someone has a line of credit already that they'd like to put towards an option um, and savings. So usually it's, it's a combination of the two or it could be just one or the other. So we cover most bases. Okay, we might just skip through and just talk now, start talking about some of our, who'd like to hear about some of our actual projects? Okay, because we've got a number of them. Um, what we might do, Josh, I think is just, we'll, we'll give two examples tonight and then Jamie's going to talk about some more tomorrow. Let's have a bit of a discussion about Wallen, the Secret Valley Estate, what that's all about and, yep. and why the area. Okay, well, has anyone here actually heard of Wallen before? couple of people, no, that's okay. Um, look, Wallen is in what we call the Northern Corridor of Melbourne. As you can see here, we've got the west, 
the southeast, the south, which is ocean, and we've got the north, where you can see the laser is. That's where our particular project is. Can I just get a show of hands? Who's actually heard of the term the urban growth boundary? Has anyone heard of that? Maybe not so much because you're in Queensland. No, that's OK, a few of you. OK, so who here has been to New South Wales before? Show of hands. Excellent. So Warren, you're from New South Wales. If someone was living, say, 30, 35 k's uh, out of the Sydney CBD and they had to leave for work at rush hour, how long do you think it would take to get them? Well, if they were driving now with some M4 problems, it can be an hour 45 to, an hour and to 45 two hours. Minutes. So Sure. Yeah. Well, look, as most of you are aware, uh, Sydney was colonised first, and even though it's a fantastic place to live and it's extremely expensive, it's not exactly a master-planned city because it just happened to be first as opposed to Melbourne, which came second. So the government has basically tried to learn from the mistakes that they made in Sydney as far as livability is concerned. Um, as Warren just mentioned, it takes a very, very long time just to do something as basic as driving to work. So what they're trying to do with Melbourne is actually adopt the London model. They're capping the growth of the urban sprawl around metropolitan Victoria, and they're creating, I guess, what you could say an imaginary boundary. Um, the whole idea is if they can cap the growth, they can keep it livable, but they still want the population growth. So what they need to do is they need to encourage places like Shepparton and Bendigo, satellite cities, to become their own self-sufficient areas. And the only way they can do that is to do what we were talking about earlier, government infrastructure, extra transport, uh, making sure there's plenty of jobs, education, et cetera. So we've strategically located our particular project just where the edge of the urban growth boundary is because we want it to be in an area that we know is going to go up and running and there are going to be people there, but we don't want it to be so close that we can't pass on any savings and lock much value in for ourselves and for our members. So this is just an example of one of the concept plans we have for the Wallen project. As you can see down here, we have some larger properties that have proven very popular over the last few months. These properties are actually over 4,000 square metres. And then on the other side, we have, I guess, what we call more entry-level properties, ranging from 400 square metres up to 2,000. So we really do have something for everyone because we understand different people have different needs. And based on those needs, we can find a particular property in the state that suits their requirements. This is just another example of some pricing. So for example, you'll see the option price. That's the price that you pay today for the opportunity to secure a particular property for an extended period of time. And then you'll see the land price. That is the price of the property, or what we could say the value that you're locking in today. And the idea is you pay that price at settlement, but of course settling in seven to ten years, what tends to happen to property every seven to ten years provided that you secure it in a good area? What's that? Yeah, it doubles. It tends to double in value. So the whole idea is securing today's prices, not having to pay for an extended period of time, locking in the value, and then realising capital gains later on down the track. So. Uh, tomorrow, Jamie will be talking about how you can get a block of land where you pay for the option, invest in the option now, and pay for the block of land over a period of time for just one dollar. All right, you may have heard about that. Who would want to hear about that idea, settling on a block of land for a dollar? That'll be tomorrow. Um, okay, we might move forward to Townsville, uh, which is a bit closer to people's hearts, I'm sure. And have we got the video in there, guys, or...? OK. So if everyone could just spend another two minutes and let's have a look about... Now we're actually going to look at a project hands-on to get an idea of what's going on with Townsville. Fantastic. Introducing Townsville. Townsville is the largest city in regional Queensland with a population of 234,000 and steady growth of 2.45% per year, the city is located adjacent to the beautiful Great Barrier Reef. By 2036, Townsville's population is expected to grow to 361,000. The city's strong local economy has allowed it to double Everyone's vision 
for its CBD is to become a hub for more than 30,000 workers and residents. Welcome to Oak Valley Lakes Estate and Resort. The planned estate is just over 15 minutes drive from the CBD, stunning beaches and the gateway to the Great Barrier Reef. The estate is a unique opportunity for investors who will take advantage of the potential growth of this pristine area. The estate is likely to produce between 1,000 and 1,500 lots. It will embody a resort type environment for residents and guests to enjoy. The estate will contain an infinity pool overlooking a beautiful lake with a private beach. This unique project also presents an opportunity for investors to access one acre super lots. A super lot is subject to future rezoning approval, however it can be divided into smaller lots, boosting an investor's profit. For example, a super lot could increase tenfold from as little as $130,000 to $1.3 million within 10 years by simply subdividing it into four smaller lots. Whether you're planning to expand your property portfolio or just want your own slice of paradise, the Oak Valley Lakes Estate and Resort is an ideal investment opportunity. Fantastic, thanks for that guys. Um, all right, now it's, uh, it's time for a short quiz. We've only got a few minutes left, so we'll make this nice and quick. It is open book. Um, who wants to tell me what was one of the first dot points when it came to the key fundamentals? What was the top one? jobs in every sector of the economy. So who can give me an example of one of those sectors? Tourism, fantastic. Now, does Townsville have tourism? Yes. Absolutely, it's uh, right adjacent to the central part of the Great Barrier Reef, and it's got a lot of other facilities such as Magnetic Island. What else? I heard someone else say mining. Mining's another sector as well. Um, sorry? Military. Military, absolutely. A yeah. uh, little known fact by my colleague Jimmy, who's a bit of a, uh, a guru in Townsville. Um, during World War II, Townsville was the, had the base for the largest American military presence outside of America. And to this day, it still has the Air Force and the Army barracks, wasn't it, Jimmy? Yep. Beautiful. What other fundamentals do we look for when it comes to investing in property, guys? Government infrastructure. Those of you who don't know, Townsville actually heads the head office for the Australian Tax Office. So lots of jobs, government safe, steady jobs in the area. Um, there's a few other things that are happening in Townsville as well. For example, Queensland election time. Uh, Newman banks on the remaking of Townsville. The Queensland government is banking on a $150 million stadium to spark an urban renewal of the North Queensland capital. Uh, what other articles do we have, Warren? Um, in terms of uh, articles about Townsville, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, in terms of, first of all, I might just ask a question, who's actually been to Townsville? Okay, most people in the room. So let's not spend any more time on Townsville. Let everyone agree it's a place where a lot of people would want to go, all things being equal. There's big growth in that area. Um, our whole team went up there, by the way. I think about 12 or 13 yeah. of us flew up there. We went out to Magnetic Island. We went all over the property. We had a look around the business side of things there. It's, um, it's a great area and it's a very exciting project for us. Our plan is to actually put a beach in. There's a lake outside. You can have a look at the concept plan. And we're looking at having like echo accommodation in there as well on top of the projects. I'm going to keep moving, Josh, only because of the time limitations that we've got. So can we maybe just go through some of the key yeah. points is land banking just very quickly go yeah. through those points no worries guys look just wrapping up one of the things i like to do at the end of all my consultations is just asking people why are you investing in real estate why are you looking at land banking and these are the top five answers that i do get from my members perhaps they ring true for some of you as well uh, one of the most common i get is just helping their children into the market they might have children who are 10 15 years old and they understand in the next 10 years what's going to happen to property prices again, they'll, they'll probably double. We are going to get to a point, like some countries, where a certain generation just will not be able to enter the property market. So this is a good remedy for that. Um, another common one I get is members between the age of, say, 40 and 60. Uh, perhaps they've been through something, uh, an uncertain time, and they're just trying to find additional funds for their retirement. And we'll touch on that just before we finish off. Um, have something to leave behind for future generations. Who here would like to at least have the opportunity to leave a property behind for their children or their grandchildren? Yeah, most of you, why not? It's gonna get harder. Um, 
currently over leveraged. I mentioned before, some people already have two or three investment properties and land banking is just another way of securing that extra property without having to go back to the banks. Um, and the last one that I'd like to finish on is just not wanting to live on the pension. Just before we go to the next slide, does anyone want to have a guess as to what the average pension is around per week or per, per fortnight? Does anyone want to have a guess? It's it's below the poverty line. Can we just go to the next slide, please? Um, this is just a, a screenshot I took uh, before I made the trip up here. Um, this is just a screenshot. And what you can see here is the maximum basic rate for a single person on the pension right now. It's $762.20. So when you divide that by two to get a weekly rate, it comes up to about $391. The reality is around Australia, most people are earning between fifty dollars and $70,000 a year. Can I just get a show of hands? Who can see themselves living off $391 a week in 20 years' time? Anyone? No, nah, I didn't think so. Um, and for people such as myself, the younger generation, I see a few of you in here as well, I'm not really certain that we're even going to get the pension. They've already lifted it up to 70 I think it is now. Was you know, you're pretty much there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and on that... In fact, can we just give applause for Josh now? Who, who can see that Josh is extremely knowledgeable? He's been around property for years. He's actually 58 years old. He just looks after himself very well. What we'd like to do, who is at least a little bit interested about finding maybe just a bit more about land banking? Hands up. Great, about half the room. What we would like to do is, um, up, we're going to have a break, I think, just for about four or five minutes now, where you can go up the back. If everyone turns around, you'll see James. James isn't the woman. Thank you. Fabe, Fabe is the boss of the company, if people don't know that yet. Hi, Fabe. <laughs> OK, so James, one of our consultants. We've also got now, I think, about another six or seven consultants in Melbourne. You may have spoken to some. But what I would suggest you do is just go and put your name down for a complimentary consultation. We can do this over the phone during the week or at a time that suits you. That really is the next step. Um, we think land banking is a fantastic concept. I've got to acknowledge Jamie. Um, he's just stepped into the room, so I won't embarrass him, but I think it's one of the best creative strategies he's ever come up with in the 18 years that I've known him, because I've seen people, as I said, I've got a young university student that has saved really hard, bought a lot, and her actual words were, Warren, I live in with all these people in their late 20s. They're never going to get a property. I don't want to be like them. And on the other hand, I've got people in their 50s and 60s and people with self-managed super funds doing this. So does it sound like an exciting strategy? Yeah? OK, great. What I'd like to do is, during this short break, go up, give your name to Fabe or, um, and James. They'll be able to take the next step forward. On behalf of Josh and myself, I hope you've enjoyed this. I look forward to seeing you. If you're not investing in property, invest in something else in this company. It's a great company to be around. Thanks very much.